A decade ago, the world was captivated by the mysterious disappearance of a mother and her sons during a safari adventure. The search efforts yielded no clues, and the case remained an unsolved enigma. However, the quiet town was shaken to its core when, out of the blue, the now 22-year-old son emerged at his grandparents' doorstep, his sudden return raising more questions than answers. Sonia and her sons, Jeremy and Terry, had been on one of their bucket list vacations to South Africa. They had only been there for a week, but they both already loved every second of it. They went on various safaris and visited a nature park not far from their accommodation. They still had two more weeks of traveling to do, but they knew nothing could break their holiday spirit. It was one of the things that made this case so compelling. From the outside, it looked like the two of them were having the time of their lives. A young single mother with her son on vacation, full of laughter and completely forgetting about their normal lives back home. But what was really going on behind closed doors, nobody knew. One morning, they went on a safari tour with a ranger. They were in a group of about 16 people and drove around the huge nature reserve close to their accommodation. It was during their first stop that they suddenly disappeared. No one knew or saw where Sonia and Jeremy had gone, and no one had heard from them ever since. As soon as the ranger had noticed them missing, he had sounded alarm. The nature park was closed off, and a search began, combing out every inch of the park. The park was filled with wild and dangerous animals, so only trained rangers were allowed to do the search. It slowed the process down a bit, but it was the best decision for everyone else's safety. Days went by, and Sonia, Jeremy, and Terry were still missing. Not even their footsteps were found in the park. The rangers and locals began to lose hope, and by the time Sonia relatives heard about their disappearance, there was nothing more that could be done. They held a wake for their loved ones, fearing the worst had happened to them. It became national news, a mother and her sons missing, probably killed by wild animals in South Africa. The family even hired a private detective and flew him over to the national park so he could do his own investigation. But it all led nowhere. Eventually, friends and family realized there was nothing more they could do but grieve. And so they did. Years went by, and the lives of Sonia's family were picked back up. Jeremy's father remarried and even had a new baby. Jeremy's grandparents still prayed every night for his and Sonia's safe return, never giving up hope. Then, on one random Tuesday, their doorbell rang. Curious about who it might be, Jeremy's grandmother, Connie, opened the door. Never in a million years had she expected to see this face again. She recognized her grandson immediately, even though it had been 10 years and he had dyed his hair brown. Jeremy, she screamed. She fell to her knees and almost got a heart attack. Greg, get here, now, she yelled for her husband. Greg, Jeremy's grandfather, had the same reaction as his wife, except for falling to his knees. He just hugged his grandson as tightly as he could, never wanting to let go ever again. For a few minutes, his grandparents were speechless. They couldn't believe they were finally reunited with their grandson after all those years. Jeremy was now 22, not the little boy they used to know. Oh gosh, Jeremy, his grandmother eventually muttered, what on earth happened to you? And where is your mother? Jeremy looked at the ground. It's been just me for a couple of years now. Connie made some tea for everyone and they sat down in the living room. This place hasn't changed at all, Jeremy said. He had a smile on his face, but his eyes only displayed pain. Jer, his grandmother sighed. Can you tell us what happened to you? Jeremy stayed silent. Then he suddenly took a deep breath. I'll tell you guys everything. 
but on one condition. Connie and Greg nodded their heads silently. You cannot tell the police anything. I don't want them going after my mother, Jeremy sternly said. Connie and Greg looked at each other with wide eyes. But the police have to know that you are back, Jer, Greg said. I'll tell them I don't remember anything, that I've lost my memory or something. They'd have no choice but to let it go. Jeremy's grandparents sighed in unison. All right, they eventually said. Immediately, Jeremy got serious. He sat up straight in his chair and looked his grandparents in the eyes. I do have to prepare you guys. This isn't the easiest story to tell. Connie and Greg reassured their grandson there was no rush. He could tell his story at his own pace. All right, where do I begin? It was early in the morning when my mother and I got ready for a sunrise safari. It would be the last safari before we would travel to our next accommodation, so our bags were already packed. I remember my mom being very excited. She was determined to spot a black rhino, you know, one of the animals on the Big Five list. During our first stop, I really had to pee, so I got off the safari jeep and ran to the bathroom on my own. I didn't even ask mom if it was okay. I just really had to go. I remember being all alone in there. Then suddenly, I heard a strange voice. It was a man telling me I had to get out of the bathroom immediately. I had just zipped up and was about to leave the bathroom when he appeared. A man, rough around the edges, stood blocking the doorway. Time to go, kid, he said, a strange gentleness in his firm grip. I looked past him, hoping to see mom, but she was nowhere. Fear knotted in my stomach as he led me away, not back to the Jeep, but deeper into the bush. The wild calls of animals echoed my racing heart, marking the beginning of a nightmare I never saw coming. Days turned to a blur, filled with fear and uncertainty. Amidst it all, I noticed something peculiar. One of the men, his eyes occasionally betraying a hint of sympathy, began slipping extra food onto my plate and making sure my water was always full. These small acts, so stark against the harshness of our captors, sparked a flicker of hope within me. Why was he showing me this kindness? It was a mystery in this hellish place, one that I clung to. As time crept by, I grew more observant of my mysterious benefactor. I saw him sabotage the gang's plans subtly, like giving them false information about our whereabouts. It was risky, and I couldn't fathom his reasons. Was there more to his story than the tough exterior he showed? Each calculated disruption, each cautious glance, suggested a depth to him that intrigued and confused me. And it seemed like my mother knew more about it. Lying awake at night, I often thought about this man who offered me secret kindnesses. Who was he, really? Why was he helping me? Was he here against his will, or was there some other motive? These questions swirled in my mind, adding to the enigma of my predicament. He was a puzzle piece that didn't quite fit with the rest, and I couldn't help but wonder about his true intentions. In the midst of my grim reality, the small gestures of kindness from this unknown man became my lifeline. Every sneaky bite of food, every protective glance, was a ray of hope in the darkness. It was a reminder that even in the most desperate of situations, there could still be acts of humanity. These fleeting moments, rare and precious, gave me strength and helped me hold on to a sliver of hope as I faced each daunting day. One day, while rummaging for something to pass the time, I stumbled upon something unexpected. Mom had a phone, cleverly hidden. My mind raced with questions. How did she get it? Who was she contacting? I watched her sneakily, my curiosity growing each time she covertly tapped on the screen. She seemed anxious, her eyes constantly darting around, 
ensuring no one else saw. This discovery, hidden so well, made me realize there was much more happening than I understood. Nights were the hardest, filled with the sounds of the wild and the soft murmurs of mom's hushed conversations. Lying in the darkness, I strained to listen, but the words were always just out of reach, muffled and indistinct. Who was on the other end? Was she seeking help, or was it something else? The secrecy of these calls, under the cover of night, added layers of mystery to our already bewildering situation. Every time I saw Mom with the phone, a flood of questions surged through me. Who could she be talking to in our situation? What was she hiding? I pondered whether to confront her, to demand answers, but hesitation held me back. The fear of what those answers might be, and the fragile thread of hope that her secrets were our ticket out, kept me silent, engulfed in a sea of my own doubts and speculations. The secrecy surrounding Mom's phone calls hung heavily between us, an unspoken barrier that grew with each passing day. Our conversations became strained, filled with unasked questions and unspoken fears. The air was thick with tension, a constant reminder of the unknowns surrounding us. It felt like walking on a tightrope, where one wrong word could shatter the fragile semblance of normalcy we were clinging to. Despite the strain and the secrets, I felt an unbreakable bond with Mom. Our shared experience, this ordeal we were enduring together, had forged a connection deeper than any words could express. In our silence, in our unshared fears, there was an understanding that we were in this together. The secrets might have been a wedge, but they also served as a reminder that we were not alone in our fight, that we had each other, no matter what the hidden truths held. One night, as I lay awake, a muffled conversation from outside our makeshift shelter caught my attention. The captors were talking about us, how our disappearance had become international news. I was stunned. The thought that people beyond these endless stretches of wilderness were looking for us, talking about us, filled me with a bewildering mix of emotions. It was a revelation that changed everything, making me realize the magnitude of our situation far beyond these confined walls. In the same hushed tones, I heard more. They were deliberately avoiding any ransom demands. It'll draw too much heat, one of them said. This strategy to Nevada law enforcement's radar meant our value to them was not in money, but perhaps in remaining hidden, an unsettling thought. This avoidance of ransom while keeping us off the grid also painted a grim picture of our prolonged captivity with no straightforward way out. This newfound knowledge hit me hard. The absence of ransom demands meant our situation was even more precarious than I had feared. If not for money, what were their plans for us? My mind raced with dark possibilities, each more frightening than the last. This revelation brought a harsh understanding of the increased danger we were in, a danger that was no longer abstract, but vividly real and immediate. As the reality of international attention sank in, I felt an overwhelming mix of emotions. To know that people around the world were concerned about us and that our story had touched so many was both heartening and heartbreaking. It gave me hope, knowing there were efforts to find us, yet it also underscored the despair of our situation, so close yet so far from this world of concern. In the quiet moments that followed, the full weight of our reality settled upon me. There was hope, yes, in the thought of a world looking for us, but also a profound sense of helplessness. We were caught in a situation far bigger than I had ever imagined, a plaything in a dangerous game we had no control over. The contrast between the hope of rescue and the immediacy of our captivity left me in a limbo of emotions, teetering between hope and despair. 
I awoke to an eerie silence that morning, the kind that screams that something is wrong. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I turned to tell mom about a dream I had, but her spot was empty. Panic surged through me. Mom, I called, my voice echoing unanswered. The realization hit me like a punch in the gut. She was gone. My mind raced with fear and confusion, each thought more frantic than the last. Where could she have gone? Why didn't she wake me? Later that day, one of the kidnappers, with a tone too casual, told me mom had been moved to another location. His words were rehearsed, his eyes avoiding mine. I didn't believe him for a second. Why would they separate us? What were they not telling me? Doubts swirled in my head, each one feeding my growing suspicion that there was more to her disappearance than they were letting on. The days that followed were a blur of loneliness and fear. I had grown used to mom's presence, her strength. Now every second stretched out, filled with the overwhelming presence of her absence. The nights were the worst, long and filled with shadows that played tricks on my mind. I missed her voice, her reassuring smile. Without her, the harshness of our reality seemed magnified, each day a battle to keep the fear at bay. I couldn't shake the need to know what had really happened to Mom. The kidnapper's story didn't add up. Every waking moment was consumed with thoughts of her. Where was she? Was she safe? Questions haunted my thoughts, an endless loop of worry and speculation. I started watching the kidnappers closely, looking for any slip, any hint that might reveal the truth behind her sudden disappearance. Despite the gnawing fear and the growing despair, a part of me refused to give up hope. I clung to the belief that we would be reunited. Memories of her strength, her resilience became my beacon in those dark times. I held on to the hope that she was out there, fighting to get back to me as I was waiting for her. This hope, fragile and flickering, was what kept me going, what stopped me from succumbing to the darkness that threatened to engulf me. In the echoing silence of Mom's absence, I had to learn to adapt. At first, every moment was a struggle against the crushing weight of loneliness. Gradually, I found ways to cope, talking to myself, replaying happier memories in my mind, and sometimes just sitting in silent contemplation. I created routines to give structure to my days, finding solace in small tasks. These routines became my lifeline, a way to keep the gnawing emptiness at bay and maintain a semblance of normalcy in an abnormal world. As days turned into weeks, I began to observe the kidnappers with a keen eye, searching for any clue about mom. Every conversation, every exchange between them, I scrutinized for hidden meanings or accidental slips. I listened for her name, for any hint of where she might be or what had happened to her. It was a desperate search for answers in a sea of uncertainty, and I clung to every shred of information hoping it would lead me closer to the truth. In the harsh environment of captivity, I found a resilience I never knew I had. The extreme conditions, the constant threat, and the psychological torment would have broken many. But with each passing day, I felt a growing strength within me, a determination to not let this situation defeat me. I drew strength from thoughts of mom, from her courage, and her love. That strength became my armor, shielding me from the worst of the despair and fear. Over time, I started to notice inconsistencies in the kidnappers' stories about mom. One would mention she was moved, another would slip and say, gone. These contradictions fed my suspicions and fueled my resolve to uncover the truth. Each conflicting story was like a piece of a puzzle, and I was determined to put them together, to understand what really happened to her and why they were lying. 
In the darkest hours, I clung to memories of mom for comfort. I would close my eyes and recall her laugh, her voice telling me stories, her unwavering belief in me. These memories were a balm to my aching heart, a reminder of the love and bond we shared. They gave me courage and strength, helping me to hold on to the hope that one day, somehow, we would be together again. Amidst the despair following mom's disappearance, something unexpected happened. One of the gang members, the same one who had been showing me small kindnesses, began to help me more openly. It was a risk for both of us, but there was a mutual understanding that we were in this together now. His assistance was subtle at first, more food, better sleeping arrangements, but it was clear he was putting himself at risk for my sake. It was baffling and heartening all at once. This unlikely ally, whom I started to think of as my guardian in this hell, taught me how to survive. He showed me how to stay alert, how to read the environment and the people around me, and how to find strength in the face of adversity. His teachings went beyond the physical necessities. They were lessons in resilience, in finding hope when it seemed there was none left. His guidance was a beacon in the darkness of captivity. As our bond strengthened, my ally began to hint at the reasons behind our abduction and, more importantly, what might have happened to Mom. He spoke in riddles and half-truths, careful not to reveal too much, but it was clear he knew more than he was letting on. Each tidbit of information was a piece of the puzzle drawing a clearer picture of the grim reality behind our situation and the potential fate that had befallen Mom. Building a bond of trust with someone in such a treacherous environment was a delicate process. It was a bond born out of necessity and survival, but it grew into something more, a mutual understanding and respect. I knew I was putting my life in his hands, just as he was risking his own by helping me. It was a precarious alliance, but it was one that gave me a semblance of hope in a situation where hope was a rare commodity. Together, we began to plot my escape. It was a risky endeavor, full of uncertainties and dangers, but it was a chance I had to take. My ally used his knowledge of the gang's operations to devise a plan weaving a path through the dangers that lay ahead. Every whispered conversation and every subtle planning session brought me closer to the prospect of freedom. It was a beacon of light guiding me towards a future that, for so long, had seemed nothing but a distant dream. The plan we devised was both daring and dangerous. It hinged on timing and precision requiring me to act when the gang was least attentive. My ally had mapped out a route through the wilderness, avoiding known gang patrols. We had to be silent, swift, and, most importantly, invisible. I had memorized every turn, every landmark I needed to look for. My heart raced as we reviewed it night after night, the reality of what we were about to do sinking in deeper each time. The night of the escape was a symphony of tension. The darkness enveloped us like a cloak, both a friend and a foe. As the camp settled into a restless sleep, my ally gave me a subtle nod. It was time. My every step was measured, my breaths shallow. The slightest sound felt like thunder in the quiet night. With every step away from the camp, the weight of what I was doing pressed heavily upon me fear and excitement battling within. In the most crucial moments of our plan, deception was key. My ally had orchestrated a series of distractions to mislead the gang. A false trail was set, leading in the opposite direction of my escape route. Meanwhile, I slipped away, unnoticed in the chaos. The thrill of fooling those who had held me captive was exhilarating, yet terrifying. Every second I expected to be caught, but the distractions worked flawlessly. 
Fleeing into the wilderness was like stepping into another world. The darkness was disorienting, the sounds of the wild unfamiliar and frightening. I stumbled through underbrush, guided only by the stars and the landmarks etched in my memory. Fear clawed at me with every unfamiliar noise, every rustle in the darkness. But I pushed forward, driven by the thought of freedom, of seeing mom again, of a life beyond these endless nights of captivity. When I finally emerged from the dense wilderness, the first rays of dawn were breaking on the horizon. The fresh morning air was like a balm to my weary soul. The light of dawn, a symbol of hope. In that moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of freedom. It was more than just the absence of my captors. It was the promise of a new beginning, a life reclaimed. The journey was far from over, but for the first time in what felt like forever, I dared to dream of a future filled with possibilities. Jeremy's grandparents were silent, letting everything Jeremy just told them sink in. But he wasn't done yet. He revealed a small, enigmatic item, a delicate, intricately carved pendant that had belonged to his mother, Sonia. He had kept it close since the day of his harrowing escape, a constant reminder of her. It was more than just a piece of jewelry. It was a symbol of their bond, a piece of her that he had managed to hold on to. Jeremy believed that the pendant was more than just a keepsake. He felt it was a clue, possibly the key to understanding what had happened to his mother. The intricate carvings on the pendant, which once seemed merely decorative, now appeared to hold a deeper meaning. Jeremy was convinced that if he could decipher the symbols and patterns, he might uncover the truth about his mother's mysterious disappearance and the days that led up to it. The pendant served as a tangible connection to Sonia. In the cold, lonely nights of his captivity and the disorienting days of his escape, it had been a source of hope and comfort. Clutching the pendant, Jeremy felt closer to his mother, as if it bridged the gap between them. It was a physical embodiment of his hope and belief that she was still out there, that her story wasn't over yet. Jeremy shared his belief that the pendant was not just a keepsake, but a critical link to understanding the mystery surrounding their abduction and his mother's fate. He speculated that there might be a message or a code within its design, something intentionally left by his mother as a clue. The possibility that Sonia had left him a breadcrumb trail in the form of this pendant invigorated Jeremy, fueling his determination to uncover the truth. The revelation of the pendant set the stage for a deeper investigation into Sonia's story. It became the focal point of Jeremy's quest for answers. This small, seemingly innocuous item held the potential to unravel the layers of mystery that had shrouded Sonia's disappearance. Jeremy, along with the help of his family and a dedicated detective, began to delve into the pendant's origins and meanings hoping to find the missing pieces of the puzzle that had haunted them for so long. Gathered around the kitchen table, Jeremy's family and a seasoned detective scrutinized the pendant. The detective, with his experienced eye, examined every curve and notch of the carving. They discussed its origin, the potential significance of its design, and the possibility of hidden compartments or messages. Each observation, every theory, was meticulously noted, as they all understood that this small artifact could be the key to unlocking the long-standing mystery of Sonia's fate. In a breakthrough moment, the detective discovered a cryptic note concealed within the pendant. The note, written in Sonia's handwriting, was faded but legible. It contained obscure references and what appeared to be coded messages. The discovery of this hidden note electrified the room, it was a tangible piece of evidence from Sonia, a clue left behind, perhaps intentionally, to guide Jeremy and the investigators on a new path in their search for the truth. Armed with information from Sonia's note, 
the detective formulated a plan to infiltrate the gang's hideout. The note had provided critical insights into the gang's operations and possible locations. Coordinating with local authorities, the detective utilized the note's clues to navigate the perilous underworld that Sonia and Jeremy had once been entangled in. This daring move brought them closer to understanding the gang's structure and possibly to uncovering more about Sonia's time with them. The detective's infiltration led to the discovery of evidence confirming Sonia's presence among the gang. Items belonging to her, along with remnants of the gang's activities, were found hidden in a secluded part of the hideout. Photographs, personal belongings, and notes provided a harrowing glimpse into her life during captivity. These findings were a mix of relief and heartache for the family, as they painted a vivid picture of Sonia's resilience and strength during her ordeal. As the investigation progressed, a more comprehensive picture of Sonia's life in captivity began to emerge. The evidence gathered from the hideout, combined with the details in the note, revealed her resourcefulness and determination. It became clear that Sonia had played a significant role in keeping herself and Jeremy safe. The investigation also shed light on her attempts to communicate with the outside world and possibly plan for their escape. This deeper understanding of Sonia's experience highlighted her incredible resilience and the indomitable spirit she possessed in the face of overwhelming adversity. The investigation unraveled the intricacies of Sonia's escape plan, a testament to her remarkable cunning and foresight while in captivity. Scrutinizing the evidence, the detective pieced together her strategy. How she used her observations of the gang's routines to find vulnerabilities, how she meticulously gathered information, and how she prepared for the right moment to act. This plan spoke volumes of her intelligence and unwavering determination to return to her son and the life they were forced to leave behind. Further revelations pointed to an unexpected alliance Sonia had formed with a member of the gang. This individual, moved by her resilience and perhaps disillusioned with the gang's activities, had become a secret ally. He provided her with information resources, and eventually, assistance in her escape plan. This alliance was a dangerous gamble, but it was a crucial factor in Sonia's survival and her eventual escape attempt. It showcased her ability to inspire empathy and trust, even in the most unlikely of places. Armed with insights from the hideout and Sonia's note, the detective embarked on a journey to trace her escape route. He followed the path she likely took, interpreting signs of her presence along the way. Abandoned shelters, discarded items, and footprints told the story of her arduous journey through treacherous terrain, a testament to her resourcefulness and endurance. Each clue found along the way brought them closer to understanding her incredible journey of survival. The trail led to a remote area where the signs of Sonia's passage abruptly stopped, this sudden end to the trail left her fate shrouded in mystery. Despite extensive searches, no further evidence of her whereabouts could be found. The detective and the family were left with unanswered questions, pondering whether she had chosen to start anew, unable to return due to the trauma, or if her journey had met an untimely end. The lack of closure was painful, but it also left room for hope and speculation about her ultimate fate. The story concluded with a small, intimate ceremony held by Jeremy and his family to honor Sonia. They celebrated her courage, her love, and the indelible impact she had on their lives. In the face of uncertainty about her fate, they chose to remember her for the strength and resilience she exhibited, the sacrifices she made, and the unbreakable bond she shared with her son. Sonia's story, though marked with mystery and loss, remained a powerful testament to the enduring spirit of a mother's love and the unyielding will to survive against all odds.